Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome inside the Guilty as Charged podcast. Uh, last week, we had a quad box. This week, we're having another quad box. Uh, happy to be joined today by a very special guest, Mr. Ode Abuji, right guard for the Los Angeles Chargers. Ode, thanks for taking the time to join us tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited uh, to, to chat with you guys today, but I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Yeah, of course, man. Happy to have you on here as well, chatting some ball, chatting some things. Uh, we're going to get Ode's thoughts on the final four, along with some uh, doing some breakdowns and some film clips as well. So uh, really excited about this chat. But Ode, first and foremost, how is your uh, recovery going? I know it's been a few months now since you've had surgery. You've been posting clips on Instagram of uh, lifting some weight. So how's that process going for you? It's been going really well. So this week actually makes four months post-op. You know, I feel really good. Haven't had, you know, any setbacks, been full steam ahead, you know, been uh, been able to push it as far as timetable goes. So I feel good. You know, I've been, you know, I've had a lot of people reach out as far as like, you know, the process and, and you know, things to be uh, alert about and kind of what to expect. And, you know, not to, not to say that it hasn't happened, but, you know, I feel like my process has been a lot smoother as far as kind of getting to the next level and progressing and not have any issues, you know, throughout my rehab and stuff like that. So it's been a grind to say the least, you know, I'm at it six yeah. days a week, twice to twice a day and uh, <laughs> trying to get back. It's the first time ever really having an injury like this in my entire career, really ever playing football. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a different kind of grind, but you know, a grind nonetheless, and it's, it's definitely paying off, you know, as, as much work as being put in. So I feel good. I feel like I'm, I'm on track and, and I, and I feel like, you know, there's without a doubt, I'll be back, you know, to normal, no, no time soon. So you had the surgery, uh, you said four months ago. Yeah, so it, uh, October, end of October. Okay, very cool. So, you no, know, the injury really threw a wrench into everything. But um, kind of what is what is your thought process about how this season, uh, I guess you know, four, through four games went for you? What was your what was your kind of experience from signing with the Chargers up until now? Honestly, it's it's probably been the best experience I've had in the league thus far going into year nine. I mean, being on a team with so much talent and and playing with a quarterback like Justin and having the front office vision, you know, trickle down to Staley's vision and that trickle down to the players, it it really feels like one here. And that's, I feel like, it's been like the biggest, you know, change I've noticed is like, you really got a team here. I think you got a a group of guys here and, and even in the staff and like I said, the front office that really care about this team and, and winning and, and trying to do everything they can to win and, and making sure players are in that position. So for everybody to be on the same page, you know, having been on a few teams now, it, it's rare, but to be on a team where everyone sees the same vision and being as selfless as the guys that we do have on a team for the kind of caliber players we do have, it's pretty rare. So, um, you know, it's, it's been, like I said, it's probably been the best place I've, I've played and, and an organization that I would love to continue to play with. It's in, and that I agree. I feel like, you know, sky's the limit, you know, a lot of young players here, a lot of young talent and, and you got a bunch of hard workers. So when you, you know, you combine those two, it, it becomes pretty deadly. No, that's great to hear. Uh, just talking about that young talent. I know you have your job in front of you and you've got to worry about the whole defense in front of you, but week one, week two, at what point are you kind of looking over to your left and seeing this future second team, all pro Sean Slater? And at what point do you know that that guy just absolutely has it? I mean, honestly, so I would, I play, I trained with Rashawn in, in, mm-hmm. in before leading up to the training camp. And, you know, oh, we yeah. worked a lot together, me, him, you know, Teron Armstead and some other guys. And I've seen him get better every day. And I've seen him I, and just through his sets and through him picking up stuff and him understanding concepts, I knew he was going to be good. I mean, that wasn't a doubt, you know, but him latching on and, and being as dominant as he was. Um, will I yeah. say I'm surprised? No. But, you know, it, it is always special to see, especially from a young player. And, you know, to be able to lock down a le- left tackle like he does and, and do it well is, is really impressive. But, you know, it just goes to show his hard work. I mean, the kid's a hard worker. He puts in the hours. He puts in the time. He asks the questions. And, and it's not like you give him an answer and it's just one ear out the other. You know, it sticks with him and he applies it to his game. I think that's something that really helps him, um, you know, continue to grow and continue to be better. You know, he's always looking for ways to be better. And. Uh, and, and asking how to, you know, how to improve. So, you know, when you have that, that combination of, of thought and, and process, and then you put together his skill set, I mean, you get what you get, in, you know, in year one. So, 
Yeah, here you got a chance to sort of start on that offensive line from the beginning with the Chargers. Um, does that kind of make a difference compared to your other stops in the league where maybe you were, you know, a backup coming in or you didn't start from the beginning of the year? Was that sort of what um, enticed you about the Chargers and how did you enjoy that through the first four weeks of the season? Yeah, I mean, it was my opportunity to come here and start. I mean, I feel like I, I was a starter midway through my career. I felt like I was a starter in year four or five of my career. You know, I just have, wasn't happened to, to be anyone's baby or to be honest with you, it was just a lot of side of it just doesn't always go your way. So, you know, being patient and being that position and putting out great film, you know, I feel like I put out solid film for the last two, three years leading up to the Chargers. So for me to come to the starting role, I appreciated the Chargers acknowledging that and seeing that I've been playing well and that I could be a starter and, and seeing that vision. So, you know, when I came here, I, you know, I had an open conversation with them. I told them, you know, I, I know what I could do. I know I could play and I know what I could bring to the table. So, you know, I want the opportunity to come in and start and, and earn my position and my keep. And, you know, they were on the same page and it just felt like a good fit and to come in. And I felt like I was able to do what I had to do. And, it, you know, obviously my injury was unfortunate, but, you know, till then, you know, I stand by my tape and I feel like, you know, I'm saying I, I know the kind of player I am. Yeah, you know, I, I, kind of speaking for Tyler here, I uh, will never forget, you know, that we got the notification that you were about to sign. And Tyler immediately hopped on to Game Pass and was like, and popped on some Lions film. And he starts messaging us. You know, he's like, holy shit, guys, like we might have gotten to steal here. Like he was so excited about that film. And then, you know, watching the first four games, I couldn't agree more with your kind of assessment, right? I think you were playing some of the best ball of your career. Again, you know, I'm not going to pretend like I watched you know, your first couple of years in the league, but I thought up until you got hurt, you guys were really gelling real at a very high level and you particularly were playing very well too. Yeah. I mean, I felt that way, you know, playing on an offensive like this, like next to Corey and you got Brian, you got Matt and, you know, it, we, it always comes having that experience on the offensive line and being, have played games and having that experience and having that common ground amongst everybody is 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 kind of what helped us gel so fast i mean we really didn't have otas with COVID being kind of an issue up and down and guys yeah. being in and out so having that common ability of having so much experience across the board and then you know everybody being there you know bringing their own attributes to the line you know just was was really the one of the reasons why we just gelled so well you know and then frank smith obviously our offensive line coach you know, he lets us be ourselves. He lets us roll. Everyone's different. I mean, I bring something different to the table. Corey brings something different to the table. So does Matt. You know, so does Rashawn. And, and so does Storm and, and every guy who's out there with us. And I think, you know, it helps that, you know, Frank lets us be that. And I think it shows on the field when we do gel together. And when things are going well, the things are going well. But when things aren't going well, our ability to correct and adapt and kind of move forward is, you know, comes with the experience that we have as a group. So, you know, just playing along those guys is, is always makes it funner. And I think it helps, you know, my job a lot. And I think it helps everyone stand out when you play, you know, a bunch with a bunch of guys who really respect the game. Yeah. You know, you mentioned, uh, of course, Frank Smith, the offensive line coach. And I, I think there was a really interesting dynamic from our perspective, because every time that coach Staley talked about Frank Smith, he also talked about Sean Surratt and somebody who used to be, you know, his own offensive line coach in Pittsburgh and, and brought a lot to the table. Was that relationship between Frank and Sean kind of unique in your experience? And really, how did the two of them, you know, help you guys kind of take that uh, next step into gelling and, and having a successful offensive line? I mean, I think Sean, Sean honestly was just as important as Frank. You know, Sean, as far as getting us, whether it's on the field work or getting us off the field write ups and things like that. I mean, he was a crucial part as far as just keeping the room flowing you know obviously you know frank can't do everything and, and sean's there to help him i thought like even when you know frank if frank had to miss time there was never a beat where you know sean where we felt like sean was missing a beat so to have that experience you know sean being in, in pittsburgh for a while and having that experience of winning and then you know frank being as passionate as he is and as energetic he is i felt like both of them were like the perfect combination you know you had the coach you had the teacher but ultimately, you had, you know, a, a man that you could trust in the room, you know, someone that you could talk to. And, you know, when you have that common ground between two coaches and the room in general, um, you know, everybody, you know, just flow. So them too, I think, you know, having Frank's first year as a coach, but coming in and being with such a veteran group, I think kind of helped him along. And I think, you know, same thing with Sean, Sean coming in and, 
used to being around a veteran group. So he already knew how to talk and, and interact with us. And that's something we respected because at the end of the day, like we're not kids. And sometimes, you know, when you deal with coaches, right. you deal with coaches who are too hands on and too this and too that. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm going into year 10, Corey's going into year nine, Matt's going into year nine. So you got guys who played a lot of ball and who are a bunch of grown men. So at the end of the day, it's treat them like a professional in you would think is a very common thing, but it isn't. And I think, you know, Frank and Sean do a great job of, of kind of keeping a happy medium between being a coach and, and, and helping us get better and, and also being a professional too. Yeah, no, it clearly worked. And I don't think we've seen an offensive line perform this well for the Chargers in quite some time. So we really appreciate all the Not in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Not for a while, for sure. Um, Ode actually had a question that stems from when we had braided on last week because he broke down some plays with us. And one of the things he pointed out breaking down the first play of the Steelers game is that he knew the alignment across from him was going to be a bit jittery and maybe susceptible to lunging or overextending because it's the first play and it's prime time and all that. And he might have also noticed that on film. So I was just curious, and this might also lead into, um, and you can talk about this during the film study as well, you know, on the opposite side of the ball, are there any tendencies or, or habits that you pick up like that, that you could share? And, you know, how much of what you study consists of knowing the habits of each individual opponent? Yeah, I mean, I think that's huge. I think when you know you, the kind of guy you're going to play against, if, if he's a guy that takes a couple of plays to get warmed up, then maybe mm -hmm. he's a guy you could get on earlier. But if he's a guy that likes to come out humming and, and likes to try to set the tone, then you know, maybe you can't, you, you know, that's the kind of player is. But, you know, for me, every game that I go through, you know, before I even watch an opponent that week, you know, I always like to, my practice reps and my preparation, I truly feel like a lot of times if you do get beat in a game, it's it, t nine out of 10 times because of you. It was either a bad set, bad hand mm -hmm. placement, mm -hmm. you overset, you know, maybe you weren't as focused in, in a recovery or whatever it is. So I always like to go back to myself and, and kind of break mm -hmm. down myself first. So throughout, you know, the week of practice, I like to be, as far as you know, making sure I have all my shit in order before I start worrying about someone else. And when I have that in order, then I'm able to break down an opponent. And and you know whether he likes to, if his right foot is back, maybe he has a tendency to always you know want to slant inside. Or maybe if his outside foot is back, maybe he likes to go to a stutter jab move from there. So, I mean, it's it's a track record. You kind of you know when I watch film on guys, I like to watch a couple of games. I like to watch them. I don't watch all the games because I, I I don't think there's a lot of quality in, in a lot of players, but as far as Lyman goes, if, if I if there's a game where he's playing against a, a Lyman that I like or someone, you know, of, of you know, who's had great success in the league, it's a game I'd like to watch and stuff like that. Cause I mm. get to learn from from that guy playing guard and I get to mm. learn how that guy's gonna react to certain moves. So it's kind of a combination of things as as breaking down film and, and stuff like that. But I really believe it starts with yourself. When you got mm. your stuff in order and you and you got everything prepared, man, you go into battle confident as hell. So and that, yeah. I feel like, is like 99% of the battle. Love it. Yeah, I wanted to get um, sort of an offensive lineman's perspective on how the offensive line changes, you know, when guys are coming mm -hmm. in and out. Because obviously on this team, we had Brian Balaga go down uh, week one, unfortunately, didn't return. Um, you, after the Raiders game, and then you sort of had Storm Schofield um, and, you know, other guys come in in between um, with the main three on the other side of the line and Lindsley Filer and uh, Slater. Do you feel like um, it's harder or easier to kind of do those moves during the season? Uh, or, you know, also if you sort of had that main five that you started the season with, do you think you guys kind of would have been in like a better position long term? Uh, honestly, I think Storm and, and Sko stepping in, I think they did a great job. I think Storm battled his ass off all year. I mean, under circumstances, it was. I think, uh, you know, we got into a lot of situations where, it just happened to be a shootout and we're going to be passing and that's tough to do down after down. So kudos yeah. to those two guys who continue to battle throughout the year. I, I think um, same thing with Sko. I think having that experience, like I said, of Sko being, you know, going into your nine now and being have played a lot of ball and, and having and having that common ground. So I don't think it was too hard for us. I don't think it it it, uh, it was it was a big transition for us because of the experience we had and and having that, like I said, the rest of the guys along the line who were able to pull those guys along and, and bring them along. So I think as a whole, as a group, it's what's expected of us. I mean, as a lineman, you're, you're pretty much taught that day one of the NFL is like, listen, anything go, go, go down. You could be playing tackle. You could be playing next quarter. You could play center. You could, you could finish a game at guard. So it's like you always have that mentality in your, in your head as a lineman that it's like you just you, you're set. But listen, if like worst comes to worst, if something happened, like 
you know, someone who had to kick out the right tackle. And maybe because Filer's played right tackle, he's going to kick out mm-hmm. the right tackle, but he could start the game at guard. So it's like so many situations that we're constantly, we're always taught in our head that uh, that it's kind of embedded in our head. So when it does happen, it's not like shocking to anybody. You know, it's okay, kind of next yeah. man up mentality. Yeah. Were you a Absolutely. backup or emergency anything along the offensive line? Yeah, my first my first year, I was my first my I would say probably my first four years, I was a swing guy, so I was playing guard and tackle. I would be the mm-hmm. sixth man in or or the seventh man, so I was a little bit of both. Played some jumbo tight end here and there, so I was kind of like you know those. So I've been in that position where you have to be ready, you know. Like yeah. I mean, I've been dressed for games and haven't played, and it's like, but listen, at the staff of a dime, I get called in at the middle of the fourth quarter, and then mm-hmm. like okay, I've been, you know, so. It's a matter of just being ready, and I think having that process of just always being prepared for the for anything, it will always make you, uh, will always just you know have that in the back of your head to stay ready. Hey, I ever ask you to play center because I know that Senio had to be uh, no, Corey's backup okay. for your game. That's nope, that will not do that for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will play tackle for you. I will play guard, but I will not play center for you. I uh, I gotta ask you before we get this uh, last thing. Did you see uh, when the Niners put Trent Williams at H back last week? Trent's kind of, Trent's kind of an alien, world, huh? I think the world felt Trent in most. <laughs> I mean, that was that was incredible, man. I think Trent's probably one of the best players I've ever seen play the game. And I've had actually had opportunity to train with Trent when I played with Houston. Um, he had a gym there, him and Adrian Peterson. I remember training training with Trent and just not even trying to keep up, but like just seeing, you know, the stuff he was able to do, man, at, at that, his stature is pretty special, man. And it's a lot of fun to watch him play. You know, I think he's brought a lot of positive recognition to the offensive line as, as far as what he really means to the game and, and what he brings to the game and what it feels to have a solid left tackle, you know, like him. Yeah, he certainly has made it uh, a much cooler position, right? And when he's doing things like that, that's only going to – you know, add some to that, but I, I credit Duke a lot with that too, because Duke, Brandon Thorne, and all these guys, like it, it's giving us casual fans like an opportunity to really sit here and learn about the offensive line and, and you know, be able to really at least semi understand like what you guys are going through. So I think Trent making it cooler it helps, but I think, you know, people like Duke popping up and Brandon Thorne have certainly helped kind of take that position group further along as well. Yeah, no, for sure. I agree. Man. I, work, I work with Duke. I work with Brandon. I think, you know, Brandon's passion for the game is why he's where he is now, why he's blown up as a top offensive line editor breakdown, because like he truly cares about it. You know, he doesn't go about it just to, you know, like he's passionate about the game and he loves watching trench warfare. And, you know, the more he breaks it down mm-hmm. and spotlights it to people the way he does, I think, you know, continues to attract interest. And then Duke, you know, always being as passionate he is. I've been with Duke now for about four years. And, you know, to see him where he's kind of started and doing his own thing to being pretty much the, the face of the, the O-line groups and, and things of that sort in the NFL. I mean, like, you know, that doesn't just come because guys want it. You know, those guys are really passionate and Duke's really passionate about the offensive line and them too. Just it's kind of like when you meet the perfect creator and the perfect editor and someone who's <laughs> great at, you know, videos and someone yeah. who can make really good put the videos together. And it's like you get a You get a hell of a combination. So, you know, kudos to them. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So let's uh, let's hop in here. I'd love to kind of get some of your thoughts on uh, some of these plays right here. So the first one that I have, uh, I don't know if you can remember all the way back, obviously, you know, f- six months ago to the first week of the season. But um, this was one of the plays that um, this is going to be a Texas route to Keenan Allen here. And uh, I'll run it through really quickly. Just kind of want to get your thoughts on what you're looking for as an offensive lineman as this play is is going down. Well, let me see. Can we see from that back? Do you have the back view of it? Yeah. 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 So pretty much we got we got three we got three bigs to the right. You know what I'm saying? So on the left, it's really it's a five down call. It's five on five. They're trying to get five individual matchups for us. But you know, with Washington as good of a front they were, you know, this is, I could see, see this guy at the three technique, he's leaning hard. So I know he's trying to set a game. He's trying to pick a center for him to normally, he's a normally a two hand guy and he's more, I would say st- straight up on me as a, as a more uh, stuff to explain. Like he's not like as a tilted standard as alignment he here. Yeah. He's tilted here. Everyone's tilted. And this linebacker right over on the defensive end, 
potentially could could come down. If he comes down, everyone's got a spike. So everyone's gap protected. So everyone's got to go left if he does. But he ends up bailing, so everyone stays in their gap. But if you can see here, they try running a game here. They try picking Corey. I try to snap the guy across Corey, and I pick up the looper coming across. I know it's, it's kind of, you got, you got, if you have slow-mo there. But yeah, this is just a five-down call. We made the guy over Matt a big, and we called it a day. We went to work. Awesome. Yeah. I, you know, we mentioned the, the struggles last year. This is something that I feel like last year's group would have really struggled with, with this kind of stunt. But, you know, Tyler asked you earlier about like, um, you know, picking up on alignment and things like that. Is that, um, I can't tell if that's Jonathan Allen in front of you or. I think that's not, not but you could even tell, like, for example, like when we study, look at a guy over at Filer, does it look like he's trying to come forward or it looks like he's trying to go horizontal? If you're trying to rush somebody, you're probably going to be looking at him trying to get off the ball. But this guy, he's not even a rushing stance. He's not, he's too, he's too, it's kind of like he's bluffing, you know, and then mm. the snap of the ball, he kind of takes two steps and goes, you know, tries to loop around. So when you see that, you could kind of tell, okay, this guy's lighting his feet. There's no way he's going to try to come downhill on a 330 pound good dude when he's lighting his feet like that. So, you know, tendencies, you kind of can see guys' body's position, I think having a feel for what, what they're trying to do. You know, and I know this game, you know, they didn't really beat, beat us one-on-one -on -one across the board. So I knew they were going to have to try to get to games and stunts and stuff like that to try to beat us. Tyler, Alex, any thoughts here before we move to the next one? No? All right. So the next one that I have here uh, is from the Kansas City game, the week three game, or week four game, excuse me. Um, this is a run play. I think this is a run play that you guys do quite a bit and, or at least did quite a bit. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of just run it, but I, I like here cause it's like the, the fake leak concept that, uh, you guys have had a lot of success with, you know, Jared and Donald and Steven, uh, kind of, what are you looking at here as we get the back angle, uh, preparing for this run play? So for us, this is just we. This is just our our pretty much our crack. So we have somebody coming back across the formation to cut the backside defensive end, and that kind of that guy going back kind of freezes the linebackers just enough for us to get play side. So we're just running zone here. So we're mm -hmm. all just running front uh, outside zone to the left here. So you got Rashawn based up there. You got Corey and and uh, Matt working to that first backer. And me and uh, me and Storm are working to whoever drops down, which ends up being, I believe, this guy over uh, outside of, um, yeah, is, is that 30, 32 or 35? Yeah, so we're pretty much running outside zone left. We have the tight end coming back just to hold the defense just a little bit to respect it. And that's it. We're all trying to reach and run at this point. Everyone's trying to hit front side combinations and stay in your gap. The biggest thing on outside zone, like, you know, you never want to turn back on outside zone, especially once you're in the play, because there's so much things just flowing to the to the front side that there's a good chance like you'll be late if you try to go backside. And the good chance that guy was not even going to be making the play. So we're just running outside zone to the left here. And we got that tight end coming back pretty much just to hold the defense for a hot second, thinking something's going to you know wrap back there. So uh, something that I, I always notice with you and, and Corey and Matt in particular, you guys are always kind of looking back and forth at each other and and having a lot of, a good line of communication, it looks like to me. So right here with Storm, because you guys are the combo block, essentially, what kind of conversation are you having right here at the line of scrimmage with, uh, you know, your blocking partner, if you will? So I'm just trying. So we're, we're running a B, which is a backside combination between the guard and tackle. So running a B block, but now since the defense is not really set, we're just running a beat to the spot. So right before the ball is snapped, the defense is moving. So say our our, our potentially back, we could have ran this B block to 56 and Corey okay. and Matt are, push, are pushing to 49. But because everyone starts going backside with that tight end, that changes. Now, now see, it holds 56 right there. And 56 is behind Corey. That motion held him there. So really, if that guy ran through, he wouldn't even make the play. That's why they tell you not to turn back on the outside zone. So that motion held him right there. And see, my guy went from 32 to, to 38 to now 32 dropping in the box. So really, I'm just telling Storm at this point, like, hey, we're running a combination to whatever appears to us first. So for me, I'm trying to get – when I got nothing laterally like that, as far as linebacker goes, I try to get vertical sooner. You know, I think this guy flashing in front of me held me for a hot second, but 
normally you would try to get vertical when there's really no secondary, when no secondary, you know, flat linebackers or target. It's really either safety dropping down or someone to replace him. Love that. Yeah. I just, yeah, I think this uh, game, you see uh, Chris Jones obviously here uh, sort of getting double teamed initially by uh, Lindsley and then also Filer uh, over there. So uh, I think this was the portion of the season where he was playing interior, but he was also playing a lot of edge. Um, and yeah. then later in the season, they shifted him out um, to back to the interior once they signed Elman Ingram. When you talk about a, a pass rusher like Chris Jones, is there sort of like a difference um, in, in terms of his physicality when he's playing edge versus interior oh uh, i mean i feel like playing an edge i feel like a lot of guys like playing edge because there's more space to work with there's less of a chance that you'll probably get double team you know if you play three techniques you know you either have a guard and center or you have a tackle and guard so you know it could be unless you're going five oh or five down look it could be a double team so i could see a lot of guys liking trying to play the edge more but you know with chris i think you know i think he's he's really well, what, he's really good with his hands. You know, it's not for him. It's not the big movements. It's it's the real quick, sudden movements that like catch mm -hmm. you off guard. You would think a big guy like him is gonna try to always hit you with power, and he will. But I think you know when you watch the film and you see how he's made a lot of plays, it's always either a quick hand swipe or it's a quick. You know, his hands are, are always tight to his body and his ability to able to kind of counter every move that he's making that you counter. So. You know, for him, I, I think it's the subtleness of his hands, you know, that, that makes him so good. Um, and, and I think personally he, he's, he's better in tier than he is on the edge. Yeah, I, I would agree with that one too. I uh, Last play here that I have uh, is one of the more fun moments that we've had, especially from an offensive lineman. I'm sure you'll recognize it once we get going here. Um, this wheel route touchdown to Austin Eckler um that ends up with the uh i think it's the dirty dancing pose where you where you oh lifted him God. up <laughs> before we get to the play uh did you and austin talk about that did you guys like practice it walk me through that celebration process not nothing i mean I, he scored and i just <laughs> ran down there to meet him and he jumped and i was like okay well i'm gonna just put my, i'm not i'm not gonna let you hit me so he jumped and i kind of try to you know, I ended up raising him, and I was like, man, as I did it, I was like, okay, this is cool. And then they came out, you know, with, with the dirty dancing thing, and, you know, the Chargers are undefeated on social media, man. They're, they're, they they nailed it with that one. But no, man, I was just hyped for Austin. <laughs> it was a hell of a play by him. So I was just trying to get down there before I was out of breath. <laughs> before you had a breath. I love it, man. I love it. They, uh, they definitely are undefeated. I love the way that they ran with that one. Um, yeah. Really love this play design, but as you know, we go through this here. As you're playing a team like the Raiders, obviously, you know Max Crosby. Uh, actually, I think this is Carl Nassib on this play, but um, you know, in this kind of situation where you're you have Storm going up against a guy like Crosby, and, and, and maybe not on this play, but what's kind of the thought process for you as you try and, and figure out what to do on this play? I mean, it depends. Like for us, if we're getting called, if uh, it looks like here we have a slide to the left. So I'm sliding down on the shade, which puts Storm 101. Um, got to put on the big boy pants, which happens all the time. But, you know, for me, if we got a call to the right, you know, and I see Crosby, I know Crosby's a big time spinner. You know, everyone does. I like to spin inside. So for me, early on in games, you know, when they try to do that, I always try to be as physical as possible and meet them. You know, I, 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 I mean, if I could, if I could catch them clean in the ribs, or I could catch them slipping, then you know, all, all the better because it makes them think twice about trying to spin and, and come to the inside. So for me, you know, like when a guy like Crosby and who has high effort, like he's a guy that's gonna keep swinging. So you got to keep swinging, and and the more you battle, and the more as the game goes on, you guys start to settle in. Um, but it's fun, you know. It's, I like playing against guys like that. I like yeah. playing against you know guys that bring out that kind of tenacity in you and. Um, it's always appreciated. All right, let's see what happens here. Obviously, we're a little bit more familiar with Gus's defense, but this is, uh, you know, he, I felt like he actually blitzed a lot more in this game than we are used to seeing. Did you guys kind of prepare for a more extensive blitz package in this game or, or kind of what was that process like uh, on the well, sidelines as you kind of adjusted to that? I mean, coming into this game, they were, you know, riding high on sacks and pressures and this and that. So it was like, you know, we thought we were, 
we were expecting to get straight up, you know, whatever defense from them, like, you know, regular defense thinking, you know, they were thinking their guys are going to be able to beat us, you know, across the board and, and, and make some plays. But, you know, this is, you know, later in the game. And at this point, you know, they weren't, they weren't beating any of us across the board, you know, and, and, you know, truth of the matter is like, we, you know, just kept Justin clean and upright. And when, when you start doing that, then teams start going to blitzes and stunts and, and, and all kinds of pick games to try to get pressure. So this, you know, when they start, you know, stuff starts to happen like this, it's just, you know, you just adapt, you know, you start to, you know, make certain guys, certain, you know, positions. And that's it. If you have one guy who's like walking around, but he's a known rusher, then, hey, OK, you know, 52 is a down lineman. It doesn't matter where he's walking around. We're accounted for him. If he's on the left side, then the two left guys got him. you know. So it's like even for this, like the guys on the left side here, no one over Matt, we're still sliding to that area. Like we know pressure is coming to that area, but we're still yeah. sliding that way. So. Um, even if it's not like, hey, we don't have anybody specific there, we know pressure's coming, you know, and then everyone's, you know, you can see gaps up here. So I think it's just breaking it down, kind of making, you know, simplifying it to the simplest things, like who's our most dangerous, you know, people here and just going to work. Bang. And then obviously uh, ends in a touchdown, so. Beauty. Yeah, that, I love that. Obviously getting Austin in, in space, I think is, Always a good call, um, you know. I, and again, can't thank you enough for taking the time to to break that down with us really quickly. I know I, I've kept you longer than we said you, than we said I would, but uh, what are your thoughts here as we head to the close of the season in, in terms of the conference championship games that we have this weekend? Uh, honestly, I, I like Joey B. I like Borough. I think he. I, I, I like his his style of play. I like he's a real tough guy. I like the confidence he plays, and and he with you know, obviously, I don't want Kansas City to win, but you know, there it's it'll be a good one. You know, I, I like San Fran as a team, and I'm, you know, I'm rooting for Stafford. So I kind of got my tips everywhere but Kansas City. So, uh, you know, it'll be a good one if it's as good as last weekend. I mean, shit, I'll be happy. So, you know, at the end of the day, yeah. you know, it's exciting, but it's always also a dose of reality. It kind of brings you right back down. Like, you know, what I'm saying we got work to do and. It's like you can't really enjoy it, you know, as 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 a player, you know, personally, like you watch these games and being in our position as a team and being as good as we were, it's like you just, you know, you constantly just think like, you know, like, damn, you know, and it's kind of so you enjoy it, but it's kind of in your back of your head is, you know, like, this is what it feels like. And I don't want to feel like this again. So it kind of kind of puts that sting in you. So, you know, you don't have to answer the question, but it sounds like I'm hearing, uh, we don't want to be in this position again. We want to go on this run. We want to do this. Is Ode Abuji back with the Chargers in 2022? Oh man. <laughs> I mean, I mean, listen, I, I do I do like you here. I love my teammates here. And you know, I've had good conversation, you know, with my coaches and, and everyone in the building. So it's been good positive vibes, you know what I'm saying? And and mm -hmm. I just leave it at that. It's been good communication and you know, things will forward and meant to fall. And, and, you know, I've expressed how, how I like to be here and, and, and it's, it's a nice fit and, you know, the, the rest is, is up to them. So we'll see, you know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, a lot of tangibles could happen during free agency. So tell so Schefter, we can, uh, we can report good, positive vibes now. All right. Yeah. Good, <laughs> positive vibes for sure. Well, I think it's safe to say that the three of us and, and uh, all the Chargers fans that watch this show are hoping you are back and, um, again, can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us. We hope that your recovery continues to be a smooth process. So, you know, we look forward to uh, watching some of it unfold on Instagram. And, uh, you know, we wish you nothing but the best going forward. I really appreciate it, Phil. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.